I received great feedback from my previous XR video regarding creating a small mixed reality games for upcoming videos, which is why I decided to make a new similar video, but this time by using the power of WebXR in Mattercraft. And yes, the great thing about it is that we're going to be able to push it to a variety of AR and VR devices, such as the Apple Vision Pro, Quest 3, Magic Leap 2, Subbox, and many others. So to get started, I'd like to walk you through what we're going to be building today. These areas are going to include creating a WebXR project by using the headsets and VR templates, creating a slingshot mechanic, creating a ball factory, or in other words, creating a ball spanner, also creating a target, creating a simple score system. Also, I'm going to be covering many new features today, such as rigid bodies, rigid body emitters, colliders, forces, Z components, creating more extensive behaviors through scripting, and also a lot more. All right, let's jump into my computer and I start working on it. We're gonna start here, and I've been prototyping a lot for the last three weeks, so that's why I have so many projects, but what you need to do to start fresh, we're gonna be creating a brand new project here and then we're going to be selecting Mattercraft. Click on Open Mattercraft. So go into Headsets and then VR, and there's gonna be different templates that were built by the Zappar team. And you can see here we have a VR template, also one for Mixed Reality, and then they add a couple more for grabbing interactions, which is really cool, and also physics. So I'll show you how to set it up from scratch by using the VR starting template. So once you click on this one, it's going to tell you here that this is supported on MetaQuest and also the Magic Leap 2 and also Vision Pro. We can also use it with mixed reality. I'll show you what we need to do to make that work. So just click on Get Started. They add these primitive shapes by default automatically. We're going to be deleting those. So just go ahead and delete those for now. Then go into Add-ons and Dependencies. We're going to click on Browse and then Physics and Networking. We're going to be installing this new component that allows you to use physics in mixed reality or any applications that you build with Mattercraft. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click on install. We can go into project here. And this is gonna be available at github.com, Dilmer V, Slingshot, MR game. And then basically that's gonna take you to the root. Once you go to the root, you can go into the resources folder and then download the audio and model zip. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and do that right now. So we can go in here. You can clone the repo if you want to. If you don't wanna clone it, you can just do what I'm about to do. That way it's a little easier and faster. So we can just do, you can do both of them, right? And then just click on download. So we have two folders. One of them is gonna be for audio and then one of them is also going to be for models. So for audio, let's go ahead and create a couple of those folders. So this one's gonna be for the arrow direction of the slingshot. And then I have different primitive shapes that we're gonna be using in the project for testing physics. So that's why I added these ones. And then this one's gonna be for a cool feature that I think it's going to, it's going to add a lot of, I don't know, coolness to this prototype. This is gonna be for the ball factory. Basically balls are gonna come down here and then we're gonna be using colliders so that the balls can go through here and basically fall down and then we can grab them and then shoot them with the slingshot. We need to set up the controller so that we can actually grab different items. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with the left controller. And the way that it's gonna work though is we're gonna to have to add a new component. So go into new physics transform and select rigid body grabber. And then I'm gonna go ahead and rename this one. It's going to be left. So this is gonna be a component that is required for us to be able to grab any components in the scene. So if you wanna grab the ball, or you want to grab the slingshot, or any of the primitive shapes that I am adding here, you're going to need that component. And it's gonna require that you set different settings in here. So for the radius, it's gonna be the radius of the grab, basically how far from the object that you're gonna be grabbing, it's going to start detecting collision zone. So I'm gonna set this one to be point one and then the grab a current distance and then everything else in here should be okay. We don't need to change anything else. So then on the left controller, there's going to be other behaviors that we need to add in order for us to make this work. So I'm going to basically set a grab state and the controller itself is gonna have a state at the point where you start grabbing an object and that's going to be on select, on select star, on select n and then there's also some other different events in here that you can select. 
For this one, we're gonna be doing on select star. And then we're also going to be selecting our grabber. So that's going to say, okay, controller, can you listen to that? And I'm gonna change the grab state on this component to be set to true, meaning that we're grabbing an object. But we also need to basically let go of the object, that way the object doesn't stay on our hands. So we can just add a new component for that. So that one is going to be again under the physics actions and then go into toggle grab state. This one is basically gonna toggle it to false. So we can just say on select n, just go ahead and select the grabber and then it's gonna grab a variable behind the scenes and set it to false on the XR manager. If you go down to the XR manager, we're going to be basically disabling the show point array I don't want to show array as I am selecting the objects because everything is going to be near interactions. We're interacting with objects that are near to us. It's going to be beneficial for things where we're doing like a distance grab. For us, we don't need to do that. So we can just disable it. And then for the start on launch, we can set it to be augmented reality by default. And then the fallback is going to be VR. So this one is going to be renamed to random objects. We're gonna be adding a collider. So if I go here and then go into physics, you're gonna see that we have a collider as an option. And as soon as I do that, you're gonna see there's gonna be a green line surrounding this object. And that's very similar to other game engines such as Unity that shows you a collider. And then if you go to the collider itself, it's gonna tell you here, okay, what type of shape this is gonna be. Is it gonna be a sphere? Is it gonna be a mesh? Is it gonna be a convex hole? So in my case, I'm gonna do a box and uh, it's going to attach specifically to the size and or dimensions of the object that I'm targeting. So I'm gonna add a new component here and this one is gonna be a material. So let me go ahead and rename that, set it to be our table material. And then for the color though, I have a specific color in here that I wanna use. So let me go and rename this hex value. It's just gonna be more of a gray color. And then to assign it to a mesh, we can go in here and then assign it to the mesh. Basically a little bit of a gray, but not too much, not too dark. And I think that looks good. So what I want to do though, is I also want to add a kinematic object and a rigid body that is going to be kinematic. So what I'll do to do that, it's going to be a behavior. So just click on the plus symbol here, and then we're going to go into physics and then basically add a rigid body. We can set this to basically report collisions. I think that's okay. You can set it to false if you don't want it to report collisions. So just know that that's going to be available. And then you can also in here, you can set the motion type to be static, dynamic, or kinematic. You can read about those descriptions in here and that's going to explain to you what they are. In our case, we're gonna make it kinematic. So we're not gonna move that object around. All right, when you finish guys, it should look like this. Basically, we just created edges and duplicated the table multiple times. And then I just added these barriers, which I call edges so that the balls don't fall. Go ahead and save your changes. So we're gonna go back into our scene here and we're gonna be adding that component. So what I'm gonna do for basically to do that is we're gonna have a table main and also a table small. And these are very similar to what Unity calls game objects or actually prefabs. And the prefabs allow you to have multiple objects on there, right? Well, these C components are basically exactly the same. You can see that I selected and now this has its own set of objects. So we're gonna be adding those specifically to our scene. You can right click here into a group and you're gonna see now that we have this table component. So if you click on it, I can select it and now it's going to be adding that component right at the pivot point. Can't really see it because we have this component in here, but we'll fix it here in just a minute. So let's go ahead and rename this one to be main. And then I'm gonna go ahead and duplicate it by doing command D on a Mac, or you can also right click in here and then duplicate. And then this one is going to be, I just call this one a small, it's gonna be a table that we're going to have right next to it.
over all of these objects, I want to have a behavior and that behavior is going to be the rigid body. So let's go ahead and add it to them. And then I want them to report collisions. I want it to be dynamic because we're going to be moving them around. And I also want to be able to grab them. So make sure that you set this grabbable flag to true. And that's how easy it is to be able to grab an object by using this tool. And then what I'm going to do, though, is for some of these ones, I want to change the way they react to physics. So if we go into the ICO sphere, I want this one to be able to bounce a little bit more. So right now, if you scroll down, you're going to see gravity, damping. There's also mass. There's also bounciness and also friction. So for the bounce, we can do something like point. We can do point A. That way we have 80% bounciness. Basically, it's going to be more you know, have more bounciness on that property than any other object in this area. And then on this one, I'm going to change the friction to be a higher number. So I'm going to set it to be one. And then the pyramids, I'm going to change the gravity percentage. So we can just go ahead and select both of them. We can say I can do that, select them both. Basically, I'm holding shift and selecting. And then if you go into the gravity here, it's set to one. That's going to be normal gravity, basically how objects are going to fall. And then I can just change it to be 0.2. Okay, next we're going to be adding colliders to each one of the random objects that we created. You can designate what type of collider is going to be based on the shape of the mesh that we generated. You can do a mesh collider, you can do a sphere collider, just make sure that you select the right collider and also the right target mesh. I'm also going to go into preview and then launch on the MetaQuest. Click on the plus symbol here, go into 3D component, and then we're just going to be calling this ball.zcom. Let's go ahead and click on it, and we're going to be creating a couple of components in here. So if you right click in here and then go into a new, there's also going to be meshes, and then also you can go into a sphere. And this is going to be the one that we're going to be using for the ball. So just go ahead and rename that to ball. I'm also going to be scaling this down because that's pretty gigantic for what we need. So I'm just going to do 0.02 and then let's go ahead and do it across all axes. And if you hit F, it's going to basically zoom into that area. We can also create a new material and I'm going to go ahead and go into materials here and then it's going to be a mesh, a standard material. We can call this ball, I should say ball material. And then for the actual hex number, which is going to be more of a reddish, type color, we can go ahead and rename this and I just paste it into my clipboard and it's going to be that red material that we have in there. Now to assign it, you can go into materials here and then just go ahead and associate it to that material that we created and this is going to be the ball that we're going to be using. So if you go down here though, there's going to be a tag and that's the tag that we're going to be using to collide and basically do some collision detection with the actual slingshot. So for now, just keep in mind that this is going to be used for collision detection. I'll show you how that works once we get to that point. So the next thing that we need to do is I'm going to also add a couple of different components under the ball. So the first one is going to be a collider. So if you go under physics and then collider, since we're dealing with a sphere, we can just go ahead and let's go ahead and zoom in here. You can go into the collider here and there's going to be a sphere component that you can basically it's going to be the shape of the collider that we're going to be using. And you can see that the collider, it's basically shaped as a sphere. And if I move it around, you can see that the collider is basically using the same dimensions of the ball. So I'm going to go ahead and do command C to undo. So once you do that, then we're also going to need what's called a trigger. And in Modern Craft, you can create colliders, you can also create triggers. So there's multiple things that might be somewhat similar to what Unity is doing. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and right click in here and then new. 
And then if you go under trigger, there's going to be trigger, which is separate to a collider. So that's a little bit different to what Unity uses, but I'll show you how that works. And then this one, I'm just gonna go ahead and call it ball trigger. And again, if you were to move these, you're gonna see that the trigger is going to be separate to the collider. So just know that that section we're going to need because we're gonna do some collision detection against an area that is going to detect when we can start pulling this ball from the slingshot. In this case, I'm gonna say colliders and then the other trigger component on the slingshot is also going to be looking for that specific tag. So that's why we are doing it in this way. So once we do these, now we can start working on the rigid body that it's going to live on the ball. So if we go in here and then click on the plus symbol and then we go into physics, then we can also add a rigid body to it. We want to report collisions on this component. We also want this to be dynamic because it's going to be moving around. And then I also want this component to be grabbable. And then the bounciness in here though, I want this to be able to bounce. I don't want it to bounce too much. So I'm just gonna set it to be about 20% of the max. And then friction, I don't want this component to have any friction whatsoever, specifically because it's going to be coming down a tube which we're going to be calling the ball factory, which we'll create after this. So just make sure that the friction and bouncing it match to what I have. You can also change it and tweak it so you guys can learn about how that works. So that's basically everything we need to do here for these components. So now if we go back into the, the scene, now what we can do though, if I were to collapse all these, I'm gonna collapse all the components because we don't need to have those open. And then if you right click on the group and then basically go to new, now you're gonna see that we have ball, we have scene and we have table. And those are gonna correspond to the Z components in here, right? So that's what those are. They're gonna be showing up in here and they have this ray icon that designates that they're going to be Z components. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and create a new ball and you're gonna see that by default it's going to basically get added to the pivot point. So I'm just gonna go ahead and move it around and we can probably just put it maybe right here. You can see that it's gonna be on the top of the table. Now, this play button and this stop button only going to be shown whenever you have the physics components installed. So we went through and added it as an add-on. So we have physics, so we should be able to do this. So I'm just gonna go ahead and hit play and you can see that, that it's going to be bouncing. I want this ball to basically have a lot of bounciness. So we can say something like one, and then I can hit save. We can go back in here, and then I can hit play. And you can see how that is bouncing quite a bit now. I'm gonna go back here and I don't want that to be the case. Go into a new and then we can create a new group and this one it's going to be called the ball. We can just say this is gonna be the ball factory and then hit enter. And then I'm also going to add a new component here which is going to be this GLB file. So if you drag it and drop it, we can also look at it though. Like you could have looked at it before I drag it and drop it so that you know what we're gonna have. Basically we're gonna have the ball going through here and then it's gonna go around, basically like a slide, right? A water slide, so I wanted to do something similar to that and then they'll be coming out of here. We'll have a spawner here that is going to have multiple balls and then we'll also have two colliders and then rigid bodies to this component so that everything reacts to physics correctly. So let's go ahead and close it and then go in here and we can just rename this so that it is doesn't have the V1 GLB extension on it. And then I don't want to cast shadows. I just want to, basically I do want to cast shadows, but I don't want to receive shadows. It just looks a lot better. So now we have this gigantic slide that we are going to be working with. Actually, this is going to be called ball slide. And then just go ahead and enter and rename it to that. So the next thing that I'll do though, is I need to have this object basically be static and have a rigid body that is static. So I'm gonna go ahead and go into behaviors here and then we can add a new physics component. It's going to be rigid body, but in this case, I'm gonna make it static. I'm gonna go ahead and right click in here and then just like what we did before, go ahead and add a collider. And then this collider is gonna be a little bit different because we need to change this from basically from a sphere or from box which we used before. We also use mesh, so we're gonna use mesh one more time. And then we need to tell it what the, basically what the component that is going to be targeting this collider. So it's gonna be ball slide. And if you wanted to, we could go ahead and clone this component multiple times. So we can just do two. And then I'm gonna go ahead and move it up. And then maybe I'll just move my view here. 
so you guys can see everything better and you can see that now they came out from the tube that we just added, all the bulbs light that we just added. So it looks like that's working correctly. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove these bulbs. We don't need to do that. Let me add a new folder and then this folder is gonna be called context. This one is not going to be a component, a custom 3GS component. It's not going to be a behavior, it's going to be a context. So this one I ended up calling the global context. All right, so this is gonna be very similar to C-sharp. We have a class and we also have a constructor and we have basically inheritance because we're extending from context and then construction props. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new variable that's gonna be public and this one is going to be called UI info and we're gonna be using this to display specific information about the app from different classes. So I'll show you what that, how that works in just a minute. So we're gonna be adding an observable and this is gonna be of type string. And then it's gonna have an initial value of an empty string. Then I'm gonna go ahead and clone this and this one is going to be a score info. And then this is not gonna be a string, it's going to be instead, it's gonna be a score. So we're gonna make it a number. And then for the initial value, we're gonna start everybody at zero. So that's what we have there. We don't need to do anything on the constructor. So we're gonna be creating a new, basically a new method in here to update the score. So you say update score. And then on the update score, we need to pass in the score value that we're going to be basically taking into this meta. And then we're gonna have a constant in here that is going to allow us to capture the current score. So I'm just gonna say current score equal. And then we can say this is score info and then give me the current score. Then we need to increment the score to whatever I'm passing in. So what I'll do here is I'll say a score info, the value equal to the current score, plus whatever the new value is that we're passing in. So just say that. So that's gonna allow us to basically increment the score without having to do this from outside this method. And then I'm gonna have another method here that is going to allow us to reset the score if we need to start over. So we can say something like this, the score info, the value, and we can just set it back to zero. So that's really all we need to do in this class. We could probably just clean it up in here. So now let's create a new component that is going to allow us to basically spawn the balls that we're going to be generating through the game. So I'm just gonna go ahead and go into Blast. And this one is going to be a custom 3GS component, which is going to inherit from group. So we can go ahead and click on that. This one I'm gonna call the ball spanner. All right, for the ball spanner, we're gonna have multiple constructor properties that we're going to be passing in. So in this case, I'm just gonna say that I'm going to need the number of balls that we're going to be instantiating. So in this case, we need to basically add attributes. So this one is gonna be a property, so that's gonna be an attribute. We also need to tell it what the default value is going to be. So I can just say that by specifying an attribute called at C default. And then in this case, I'm gonna say, well, I want the default to be five balls. And then I can also say, okay, number of balls is gonna be the name of the actual constructor property that we're gonna be passing in. And then you also need to tell it what type this is gonna be. I'm just gonna go ahead and copy this because we're gonna need another one in here. In this case, it's gonna be basically the check for spawn new balls after. And this is gonna be a check that is going to allow you to check a specific, every specific amount of seconds. We're going to be checking to see if the balls are beneath a, a white axis. And if they are, then we can spawn new ball. So in this case, I'm gonna check maybe every 1.5 seconds, I think is what I ended up doing, and then we can just give it a name. I'm gonna say check to span new balls after. And then in this case, we're also going to be doing a number, we're gonna do a comma, and then I'm also going to do another one, and this one is going to be the minimum y-axis that we're going to be requiring to basically check if the balls have been you know, beneath that threshold. And if so, we can spawn new balls. I think for this one, it is 0.25, so we can just do that. And then I'm gonna call it the mean y, and then access before spanning new balls. And again, we're gonna do, this one is also going to be a number. So just know that these constructor properties are gonna basically get passed into the constructor here. We also need to make sure that this is named as appropriate as it is. So it's gonna be a ball spanner. So this one is going to be private. And then I'm gonna say, okay, what am I going to be tracking? I'm gonna be tracking basically all the balls that we're gonna be spanning. The type in this case is gonna be ball. So we're gonna create an array of that. And then it's gonna be basically an empty array. Right now it's complaining because we haven't really added that component. So what we can do is we can just say import and then you can tell it that this is gonna be the ball that we're gonna be 
basically generating, and then we need to tell it where that is located. Well, it's, it is in the current directory, and then we can just say this is gonna be a Z component. I believe here I need to say default and then as ball. That's going to that's going to work. I don't know what default is to be honest, but I know that that is the basically the structure that you need to follow when importing one of those. And then what I need to do here, I need to also add additional properties or variables that we're going to be storing. So I also need to do elapsed time. So this one is going to be elapsed time, and then I'm going to say this is going to be a number, and then equal to zero. I also need to track the start time. And then I'm also going to do here, it's gonna be also a number, and I'm gonna set it to zero as well. And then private, I'm gonna check the, I'm gonna set this to be check frequency after seconds. And this is so that we can store basically the value that we're designating through the properties in this class. So I'm just gonna set that in the constructor. And then I'll do, in this case, it's also going to be a number, and then I'll also set it to zero. Now we also need to do another private variable, and then it's gonna be for the mean y axis before spanning. And then again, it's gonna do a number and then set it to zero. And then lastly, we're going to be basically getting our context. So I'm just gonna say this one is gonna be our global context, and then it needs to be of type global context, right? So that's all you need to do as far as the variables. So now in here though, we have a lot of things that we need to basically keep in mind. So some of those things are going to be, oh, this is interesting, this is all new. I didn't know that, that they were doing that. So I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of that method and we don't need to register loadable. But I also need to get my context. So to get my context, I'm gonna say, well, I know that this is passing a context so I can access context, which is basically getting passed into this constructor. And then this component has a get. And the cool thing that you can, what you can do here is you can say, well, I wanna get the global context. That's going to be the context that I wanna get in here. So that's gonna give us access to, to that. So I could say something like this, the global context, and you can see that we have the score info and the UI info that we added. So I also need to check in here the frequency after, and then for this one, I'm just gonna get it from the construction constructor properties. So I'm gonna say constructor, constructor props, and then this one is gonna be set to, basically set to that. I also need to do in here the minimum Y axis, so I'm gonna go ahead and set it to that as well. And that's gonna give us access to those two if we had other methods in here that we're going, well, actually we're gonna have methods in here that we're gonna be implementing, so it's gonna give us access to that as well. So the other thing that I need to do though is I also need to run here a method on every frame. So what I'm gonna do is I need to basically call register and then in register there's something called use before render and in here you can basically pass in the context manager. So I'm gonna say give me the context manager and then you can pass in a method here which we're gonna be creating that is going to be executed on every frame. So what I'll do here is I'll create another method and it's gonna be private and then I'm gonna tell it, okay, what the method it's going to be that we need to execute. And then the syntax for this is going to be as this. We're also going to have another method which will also be calling from, from the frame in just a second. And it's going to be called spawn balls. So we're just gonna do it, basically what we did, what we did above it. And then this is gonna be taking the number of balls that we're going to be instantiating. So by default, we're gonna set it to five, but we're gonna be passing in basically that information through that constructor properties. So first, we need to add some logic to the frame to be able to spawn the right amount of balls and also to check for that time elapse. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say, okay, I wanna track this elapsed time, right? And I can do that. And then I can set this to now, that's gonna give us the current time, the now, and we can subtract it by a variable called a start time, which we're also going to be keeping track of. So for right now, the elapsed time is basically gonna be set to whatever the time it is right now. And then what I can do here is I'm gonna say this the elapsed time, and then I'm gonna make sure that I am dividing that by a thousand because right now this is in milliseconds. So I wanna make sure that I check for seconds. That's just the way that I implemented it. And then I'm gonna say if this is greater than or equal to basically our variable, which is the check frequency, after seconds, then we can start looking for all the balls that we have in the current scene, right? So what I can do now is I can add a check. So I'm gonna say balls above minimum, 
So, and then I'm gonna set it to equals and then I can say these dot balls. So this is very similar to link. In this case, this is using a fine. And then I can say, okay, for every ball that I currently have in this array, I'm going to look for some specific attribute. So I'm gonna say, okay, first I wanna know, give me the ball mesh, right? So I'm gonna say ball mesh. And the way that I get the ball mesh, which remember we renamed the mesh to be called ball. And there is a get method in here that I can access. And then this is gonna basically take in a name and that's going to allow us to get basically that mesh component that we added. I'm also going to be getting the ball world position. So if we need to create a new vector three and then get the world position of an object, this is gonna be the syntax. And then I'm gonna say new, new vector three. So you have to create a new vector three. And then once you create a vector three, there are there's a method on the other components that allow us to basically get the world position into this variable. So the way that we do that is gonna be, I'm gonna access the ball mesh that we have in here. And then I'm gonna say, give me the element. And then out of this element, there's going to be a get world position and then passing the ball world position. So, and then semicolon at the end. So this is gonna access the element from 3GS and then it's going to access the world position of this object. And then it's gonna be put into this ball world position vector three. And then now what I can do though, is I can say, okay, well, I got the world position of every single one of these balls. Then if the ball world position, which in this case, I wanna look for the Y axis, is greater than the minimum that I designated above, I know that if I get at least one of these, then I know that there are balls that are above the minimum. And that means that I cannot spawn new balls, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, okay, well, balls above minimum, if this is equal equal to undefined, then I know that I can spawn your balls. So I'm gonna say these, the balls, I'm gonna make sure that I go into every single one of the balls that I currently already have, and then call the dispose method. I don't know if this is exactly how you can dispose the, basically keep the memory clean. This is what I ended up doing, and it looked like it was working okay. So just let me know if you think the, there's a better way to handle this, but this be that this post should basically get rid of that memory on the balls that we instantiated. Okay, and the next thing that we need to do at this point though is we need to spawn the balls, right? So I need to say spawn balls, and then you can basically, it's going to use whatever we pass it in into this object right now, the default is going to be five, but we'll implement it here in just a minute. And then we also need to reset the start time. So I'm gonna set this to day that now, that way it's going to basically get set back to now. And then if this subtraction happens again, then this is gonna be zero. So elapsed time is going to be zero. We haven't hit the max. It's going to go through that cycle one more time until it hits this value. And if it hits that value, then we're gonna go through the cycle and expand the balls as long as we have these requirements met. So the next thing that we need to do though is we need to also create the balls, right? Right now we haven't done so. So we're just calling this method. So what I'm gonna do though, is I'm gonna say global context and then debug info. Actually, I'm gonna do, it's not debug info, UI info, and then that value. And in here, what I wanna do is I wanna display that we are expanding new balls. So I'm gonna say, let me give you, let me give you, and then in this case, it's going to be the number of balls that we're passing in. So I'm just gonna say, let me give you this number of balls and then new balls. And then this is going to allow us to basically display that information on the UI once we get to working on that area. Also setting this here to start time equal day that now. The reason for that is because I'm gonna call this method from the actual from the constructor above so that we can start spawning right away and then we can reset it and then spawn new balls. So technically we could add it at the end, that way we do it right after we're done. And then what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say, I'm gonna do a for loop and I'm gonna say let the, and then equal to zero, i equal to zero, and then it's gonna be i, and then we need to specify how many balls we're going to be looping through. So I'm just gonna say number of balls, and then we can increment i plus plus, and then make sure that we follow the curly brace positioning, which goes on that same line different to what I do in C-sharp. And then what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say, well, I wanna create a new ball, and then it's gonna be new ball. And for this, I'm gonna say, well, I want to basically pass in the context, and then I'm gonna do a comma. We don't need to pass in any constructor properties in this case. And then I'm gonna say ball the position, 
and then the value, I'm gonna set this to be, basically it's going to be placing each ball on a vertical axis. So I'm gonna set it zero on the X axis. On the Y axis, I'm gonna say I, and then I'm going to divide these by the number of balls. And then I'm gonna do multiply these as well times two. I'll show you how this looks once we get to looking at it from the scene Z component. And then the next thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say this and then append child because I want these components to get appended to the current group. And then I'm gonna say ball, that's going to be the child that we're appending. And then I'm also going to be adding this ball to the array that we created above it. And then I'm just gonna say, this is gonna be the ball that we need to add to the array. And then at the end, we're just gonna reset the timer. So what I'm gonna do though is on the dispose, this is gonna be a little bit different because we need to just do one more thinning here. And in this case, I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna follow the standard for the method that I did above it. I'm just gonna say parentheses equal, and then my curly brace. So basically what we did above it. And then in here, I'm just gonna say these dot balls, and then the length is going to be set to zero. That way we can just clean up the array that we created above it. Now we should be able to add the components. So if you go under the ball factory and right click on it, click on ball spanner, and once you click on it, it should show us the properties and looks like the properties are not showing for some reason. So let's go back into ball spanner. And I think this actually needs to be Z prop. And I had a typo in there, so I thought it was just called prop. Now if we go back in here, we should be able to see the properties. So it looks like we can see the properties. So I'm gonna set these to basically be number five. And then on the check for, basically if we need to expand new balls, we can just set it to 1.5. And then this could probably be the minimum axis. We can set it to 0.2. I think that that works. So now if I were to move this up though, you can see that now we have the balls in here showing correctly. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and position it here in place until we are right above the hole for the tube. That way we can span them correctly and we can, maybe I'll just get a little bit closer in here. That way we can put it right in place correctly and I'm gonna move it here a little bit. And then I think that I think that looks good, something like that. So if you wanted to add more balls, let's say you want you want this to be something like ten, you can see that now. As soon as I do that, now you can see that the balls are spawned. It looks like it's not working because we didn't call this from the constructor, so that's another issue that we need to fix. So we can say this is going to be a spawn balls, and then in this case, I also want to pass in the, we can just say constructor properties and then the number of balls that we are designating. And then I'm just gonna go ahead and do command S to save it and then we can go back in here. And now we should be able to see all of those added. So what I'm gonna do though is, I don't want this to be 10, maybe five It's good for me. And then we can just move it down a little bit. And you can see that now they're gonna be falling and you can see that they, they fall with gravity and collide it correctly. So I could go back in here and maybe this is gonna be 10 and we can do that as well. And you can see another falling. Hit the plus symbol here, go into a 3D component. And then this one we're gonna be calling the slingshot. So I can just say slingshot. All right guys, so this is the mesh that I wanted to generate. Basically it's composed of a bunch of different mesh objects that I added of type box. So you guys can see that most of them are scale. I also added different materials in here for the trunks, also for the tapes, which is right here. And then the tool visualizer is going to be basically this area right here. So the next part that I wanna do though, which is why I'm not speeding this up, is I want to add the components that are really, really important. So this could be in Blender, but then the other parts that are really important are going to be things that are really specific to Mattercraft. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna add a new thing called the well, it's gonna be a new group, but it's gonna be for the initial pull position. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a new group. And then this one is going to be initial pull the location. 
That way we can keep track of where we're going to be doing the initial pull from. And then once we have that, we're gonna be changing the y-axis. So it's gonna be at the very top. So just think of it, if I were to pull this back out, the initial pull is always going to happen at this location, but then it doesn't matter. Like if I move the ball to the left side or the right side, this is always going to be the pivot point of the pull. That way we know the direction that we need to, basically part of the direction that we need to launch the ball front and to. That way, if we have a vector right here and then this is high up, we don't collide with this area right here. So I'm gonna say that this one is going to be a sphere trigger. And then this one we're gonna be calling the pull trigger activator. So pull trigger activator. And then the one in the ball, we didn't make it uh, is trigger. So make sure that this one is set to is trigger. We're also going to add the uh, tags. Remember that we did colliders. So that way we can handle collisions between the ball and now. So the slingshot. So the position for these that I have right now is gonna be a nine point and then two a nine. So just make sure that we do that. And then we're also going to scale it quite a bit because I wanna make sure that we are detecting collisions. Well, not 21. We are detecting collisions at our you know, wider range. Basically anywhere within these areas where we're gonna start allowing people to pull the slingshot. gonna do add here the plus symbol and then physics and then rigid body this one is going to be basically dynamic we also need to report collisions and we also need to make this grabbable so what I'm gonna do is right click on group and then new and then we can say now that we want to add a slingshot And now if I were to hit play though, it should fall just like with everything else, right? And then the balls are coming through. If you right click on group and then go to new, there's going to be something called lines. And then if you go to line, And this one is gonna be a new custom behavior, so just go ahead and select that. This one I'm gonna call the slingshot grabber, so we can say slingshot and then grabber. Then we're basically exposing different properties. So the launch force is going to be how much force we get applied to the ball when we launch it. Also the width for lines is gonna be for the line renders that are representing the actual rubber band. And also a line that I'm going to be drawing from the ball up to a specific area. And then the Z component is so that we can access basically the different notes that are available in the scene. That way it just makes it easier for me to find out where things are. Also the current grab object, the release grab object. So it's gonna be whatever we grab and it's gonna be the object, the last object that we release. And then we need to basically track everything, at least in this case, in world position. So I have the slingshot world position, the current grab world position, also the calculated forces that we're going to need. This one is going to be to determine, you know, if an area, if we can launch the ball within a specific area. So that's all coming handy with the actual trigger that we added to the slingshot and also the ball. So that's how we're gonna be setting that. Also the rubber band material are going to be, they're gonna be the lines that we're going to be representing the rubber band, also the, actual visualizer, which is going to be a three point line that we're gonna have from the left tape, also the right tape, and then basically the grab position that we're going to be using. And then the rubber band left, center, and rubber band right is gonna be designated to be the different parts of the actual slingshot. And then the target arrow direction, this is gonna be what we created where we have the arrow so that we know, you know what the direction of the shot is going to be. Also the line visualizer 
that is gonna go from the grab point up to the actual arrow, and then the material that we're gonna have for that line. I'll show you how that looks as soon as we run this. Then we have the constructor, and then the cool thing about the rigid body grabber left, which is a rigid body grabber component, is that it has a on grab meta, and we're binding to that, right? So when that happens, when we start grabbing an object, we're gonna be calling this meta, and this is gonna be for the left controller, and then when we are releasing an object, we're gonna be calling into this handle release state, and then also the rigid bodies are gonna get passed into all of these. I'm handling the on collision, in this case, leave. And as soon as I let go of the, basically there's no collision between the ball and the trigger, then I'm going to start allowing the launch object allow property, you know, equal to true. Because we know that we collided, so we can set it to true. Now we can start, you know, drawing things on the ball, the different rubber bands and also the target arrow. So that's what that's gonna be. And then we're also registering to, so similar to Unity, this is gonna be kind of like an update meta, but in this case is the frame meta that gets generated by using this use on before render, and then you pass in the meta that you want that to execute on every frame. This can be called anything you want. In my case, I just call it frame because that's what the guys at Zapar do, and I just follow the same convention. And then if we are grabbing an object, we're passing the rigid body and then setting that property, the current grab object, to, to be the rigid body that we're basically grabbing. And then the release is the one that is going to do most of the work. So here we're gonna say, okay, we do have a, an object that we're grabbing. We're gonna set that to be the release grab object. We're also going to be copying a force that we're calculating below. I'll show you that as well. Into this release force and also release position. We're gonna be copying those two different values, which happen to be vector three values. I'm also gonna say that I'm not currently grabbing an object anymore. So I'm setting that to basically be undefined. And then if we are allowing an object to be launched, which in our case is gonna be the ball, then we're gonna be calling this launch object. Otherwise we won't basically launch the object. So in the case of grabbing maybe a pyramid or you know a spear that we have in the scene, we wouldn't be launching those objects. We could if we wanted to, but in this case, I only want the ball to be the one that we launch. And then we're basically just setting that rubber band visualizer, the shot and the error direction visibility to false because at this point I already launched it so I want to make sure that the slingshot goes back to the normal state. So if we have an object that we currently have grabbed and the, the object is not a ball, then we want to do this which means that we're going to be getting the position of the grab and that's going to be the world position. We're also going to be capturing the basically the initial pull location it's going to be put into the slingshot world position. This is so that we can have the initial pull location to be right above the center of the slingshot, right, you know, between the, the V and then basically right on the top. And that way we can, we can keep that as one of the vectors that are going to calculate the direction. And then we're also going to be calculating the distance from the current world grab position and then the slingshot world position. Once we know the distance though, we can get the, the actual normalized vector, which is gonna give us the direction by just calling normalize. This is very similar to what, how we do this in other game engines. You subtract the two vectors and then you get the normalized vector that's gonna give you the direction. And then we can have some kind of a scalar. In this case, it's gonna be the launch force multiplied by the distance. And then these two methods are gonna be responsible for basically drawing the line. The rubber band is going to draw three different points. One of them is gonna be the line start point, basically at the location of the left tape. Basically that's gonna be, if, we're, if, we, if we have the, the actual slingshot like this, that's gonna be the tape that we have on the left trunk. And then the same thing with the right tape is going to be the tape that we have on the right trunk and then the middle point is going to be the current grab position so these actually work really really well i was really surprised how clean these work and how cool it feels when you're using it and then the applying pulse is also going to be executed in here when we launch the object the reason why i have this set timeout is because there is a race condition on when you let go of an object in the on release of the rigid body grabber and because of that, I had to add a little offset. So basically it's gonna be waiting a couple of milliseconds. And then if you don't do this, it's not going to work. The ball is actually not going to release. So 
And that's because the on release doesn't let go of the ball at the right time. So I go in here, you're gonna see that we have this slingshot grabber behavior that we created. I'm gonna go ahead and add it. And then for this, I'm going to make it, so I ended up testing it and the 0.5 value that we added by default is not enough. So I ended up changing that to be 70. And then the width for lines, I think too, it's fine. You can set it to a higher number. If the browser supports larger width on lines, then that's going to work. I think most browsers don't support really thick lines and it has to do with something with OpenGL. I think I have a bug and I was surprised that I didn't get a clean peel. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Cause that normal never, normally never happens. So what I'm gonna do though, is I have to add the target material. We never actually created it. So I was getting a null exception. What I'm gonna do is this is another project and you can do this on any project that you create with Mattercraft. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and copy and paste everything. So what I'll do here, I'll just copy everything here. You can right click on it and basically do copy or you can just do the shortcut here. I'm just gonna do the copy selection there. And then we can go in here and then create a new component that it's going to be for the target. Basically, you can paste it anywhere you want. In my case, I wanna keep it in Z component so that we can keep everything organized. And then what I'll do is I'll right click on the group here and then we can just hit paste. And it's gonna tell you what it's going to paste. It's gonna have different counts. And then what behaviors it's going to paste. So just gonna go ahead and do that. And then as soon as you do that, it's magically going to have the things that I created previously on the other project. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and create a new custom behavior. In this case, I'm gonna be calling this one the slingshot target. And then I also want to limit this to be limited to the target that we just created. And then I'm just gonna do the run at design time. That way we can, if we wanted to test it in design time, we could also do that as well. And then what I'll do here is I'll just right click on it and then you're gonna see that now we have this target and we can call this one the slain shot target. All right, so that looks good. And then one more thing is we need to add the behavior that we just created. So we can just select the slingshot target and you can see that it has that target icon that we just added. And then all we need to do is if we go into our slingshot grabber, make sure that you go to the handle release state that way we can reset the target at this point because at this point we should have released the ball and then regardless of what happened if we hit the target or not then we want to make sure that we release that property so that we can hit it again so what i'm going to do is i'm going to say in this case i'm going to say this as the component and then nodes and then we should have the slingshot target and then we can access behaviors and then we also have a slingshot target and then in this case, we need to call the reset target. All right, guys, so next I want to add a couple different labels that are going to be used for UI, one for the score and also one for the messages to tell the user whether they're close to the target or not. Then the next part, it's going to be what we need to display those messages. Basically, it's going to call the global context and then the global context is gonna get that data back. I also need to implement an audio manager and that audio manager is going to be basically responsible for playing the SFX and also the background music, but we also need to add the component components that are going to associate the files that we imported initially for the music and also the audio. Then lastly, we're also going to have to go back on comment everything and then we're gonna be able to now play music. The last thing that I need to do is we need to add the audio manager and we also need to basically play music from the slingshot grabber and also from the target.
Well, that was a blast and I hope you enjoy going through the creation process of this mixed reality prototype. I know I cover a lot, but if you have any questions whatsoever about a particular feature or you'd like to see more videos like this, please let me know in the comments below. Also consider signing up for Mattercraft by using the link in the description below. And I truly recommend going through this video completely. That way you understand all the different features that I covered today and you can jump in and use this video as a guide. Thank you very much for your time, guys, and happy XR coding.